Good evening, everyone. Great to see you on the screen. Wonderful to have you with us for this program tonight. And um, we will, I'm sure, be picking up others as we go, but it is just a little bit past 630. So I'm going to proceed and begin by asking Josh Kalin, the registrar here at the Dallas Institute, to give us a little bit on Zoom protocol. So Josh, could you give us a few words? Hey, sure. So <clears throat> tonight we'll, we'll hear from a number of voices, um, including Dr. LaKelly Hunt. But um, we're going to keep everyone muted uh, so that we can avoid sounds like dark, uh, or barking dogs. If you're at the Institute, sometimes there's a really low flying plane, all kinds of things. Um, so we'll keep everyone muted. Um, you can ask questions via the chat function, and Dr. Larry will um, pick those out and bring those up as, as they come in. Um, and if you need anything, just let me know. I'll be in the chat as well. So um, we'll turn it back to Dr. Larry. Thank you, Josh. So we will, we will go ahead and begin, as I said. Um, this is an, an auspicious uh, program for us at the Dallas Institute. And we've been planning for it for a long time. Uh, this is a return visit to the Institute from Dr. Helen McKelly Hunt. And we remember with fondness when she was with us before to a packed house. So um, this is a, an, another auspicious occasion. On, a, on August 18, 1920, Congress ratified the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And that amendment reads, quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And so 2020 is the centennial year of the ratification of the suffrage bill giving women the right to vote. But though our celebrations are appropriate and well-directed, and there have been many of them this year, the 19th Amendment itself is not the whole story, which is the reason we are gathered here this evening to trace an important but little known historical aspect of American women's long and heroic struggle to gain the vote, a struggle that began early in the 19th century in tandem with a commensurate struggle to bring about the abolition of slavery. Our keynote speaker tonight is actually the discoverer and chronicler of this twin struggle. And following her presentation that will begin our program, we will observe in a panel discussion with prominent guests ways in which that early struggle for freedom and equality continues even today, almost 200 years later. And you are invited, as Josh says, you are invited to participate in the Q&A session at the end of that panel via the chat function on your screen, as Josh has said. And so I want you to be articulating your questions and comments as early as possible so that we can get them to our panel. So to begin this evening, let me introduce our keynote speaker, Helen McKelly Hunt, PhD, a dear friend of the Dallas Institute for many years and greatly admired by all of us during that time. Helen is one of a small army of women who helped seed the women's funding movement that has proven so crucial to gender equality in our time. She co-founded the Texas Women's Foundation, the New York Women's Foundation, Women's Funding Network, and Women Moving Millions. For these and other efforts and accomplishments, Helen was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2001, and she is the author of two books, Faith and Feminism, A Holy Alliance, and most recently, And the Spirit Moved Them, The Lost Radical History of America's First Feminist. Helen and her, her partner, Harville Hendricks, have helped co-found Safe Conversations, LLC, a training institute that teaches safe conversations and summarizes the, the new science of relationships that can help anyone shift from conflict to connection. And so it gives me great pleasure to present to you now, Helen LaKelly Hunt. Thank you, Larry. How is the sound? 
Sounds okay? Okay. Yes. Uh, so um, let me first tell y'all why I wrote the book. Um, I really um, uh, think I, I became a part of feminism and I think gender equality is very important. And, um, and I found myself working in the feminist movement, um, but I was curious that feminism was so secular. So I thought, I think there were religious roots at the beginning and I decided to pursue studies and I entered a doctoral program. And I was looking for the religious roots of the women in Seneca Falls. And I totally accidentally discovered the proceedings of um, a convention 13 years earlier in a dusty uh, shelf of a rare book collection uh, in the Northeast. And uh, I sort of blew the dust off of this you know, really interesting proceedings. I thought, what? I assumed it was about Seneca Falls because it was a national women's convention. And I, I kept uh, trying to make sense of the fact that it, it was not Seneca Falls, but, and it turns out no one has written a book on this. And um, it basically, the, the history got lost. Um, and so I pursued a doctorate um, a, a dissertation and um, on this proceeding of a convention of American women in 1837. Um, scholars call them abolitionist feminist, um, but they call themselves anti-slavery women. And I will mention um, three points um, that basically, as Larry said, we're moving the date of um, women's, the, the birth of the, of the American women's movement back 13 years. And uh, when I had this document, um, this manuscript, almost ready for my dissertation to be um, voted upon, I sent it to a couple of publishers and the feminist press said, oh, Helen, please let us publish it. We need a book like this within the feminine press that, that highlights the importance of faith. And, um, and then uh, the last thing I'll mention, I, I knew somebody that knew Cornell West and he had just left Harvard and had gone to Princeton. And I had a chance to meet him and that was such an honor. And I kept, I was still in touch with this woman who knew Cor Dr. West. And so I decided to I, uh, call him one day and said, I've written uh, a story of some lost history and would you like to read the manuscript? And he said, well, sure. And so I sent it to him. And when he returned it to me, he said, uh, Dr. Hunt, I've returned your manuscript and I've written a foreword in case you publish it. So you don't have to use my foreword, but if you, um, if you would like to, here's the foreword of your book. So I was really touched. Um, it wasn't my writing, it was the women that he cared about. And I'm ready to start the, the, the slideshow because to me, getting these women's faces in front of you, um, bringing them out of the shadows of history is so important. So I think we can go to the next slide. Here are their beautiful, beautiful faces, the abolitionist feminists. So in the proceedings, um, um, there was a president um, of the convention and there were five vice presidents and two of them were women of color. And we can go to the next slide. And um, these, they were so courageous. I'm so excited to tell you this story and their stories were almost lost. So in the next slide, you'll see how it was really um, in the 1830s that um, women were troubled by the national hypocrisy. So we can advance to the next slide. 
um, because the Constitution said liberty and justice for all, and yet the institution of slavery was growing at a frightening rate every year. Okay. Um, the Anyway, for reasons that I won't go into, but um, basically, um, as the next slide will show you, the women got together with their husbands and um, they decided, uh, well, they said, should we form a, a society for abolition? So we can go to the next slide. Am I, should I raise my hand or? Okay, thank you. So as women, the women found the locations for the meetings as they were discussing, should we incorporate and become an organization to officially fight for the uh, dismantling of the institution of slavery in the country? And um, they found the locations. They then circulated notes so that everyone would come. They attended the minutes. I can't read yet. Okay. They attended the meetings, they wrote the minutes, they had refreshments. And so they were the backbone of the meetings that led to the founding. Now, if you go to the next slide, when the day came where they said, okay, let's start the organization, everyone stand up and um, march up here to the front of the room and sign your name that you're, you will be the founding members of the American Abolition Society. So the woman stood with the men wanting to sign their names and the husbands looked at the women and said, uh, well, sorry, you're a woman, so you can't be a, a member. And so the women went to the, they, were, they wouldn't let them sign. So in the, um, in, um, in, uh, on the next slide, you'll see one of the attendees, a lawyer whose name is Samuel May. And he wrote um, uh, uh, his own biography a, a couple years later. And he said, I will never forget. He's, he spoke, he writes about that moment. We were in this room and the impressive animated words of our um, spoken at our convention by the Duke the dear Lucretia Mott and two or three other excellent women. And the mortifying fact that we men were then so blind and obtuse that we would not let these women become members. So the women were pretty um, unsettled that they weren't allowed to speak out against, uh, against slavery like the men could. So guess what they did? They started uh, their own uh, anti-slavery societies. Next slide. So in 1833, there were seven. Uh, 1834, 17. 1835, 29. By 1837, there were 140. And they were writing letters to each other. And they said, listen, 140 of us, let's gather somewhere in the country. And instead of being local, let's have a national convention. And they were so excited. So uh, they, were, they realized they were becoming public agitators because their husbands were like wide-eyed at all this activity. So, um, so in the next slide, um, you'll see that um, uh, their faith was a major catalyst. Uh, they wanted a political voice. In the next slide, well, it'll just be a reminder that the government said, I'm sorry, you cannot speak in public. Women's sphere is the domestic sphere. Stay home. And the, the synagogues, the mosques, the church said, no, no, men speak and women are silent. Stay home. And the next slide will show you what they said. Listen, folks, God is telling me, I have to shout it out. Slavery is a sin. <laughs> this is horrible. How can we live in a democracy and have slaves? So they took their scripture very seriously. The next slide is something I found. Oh, here it is. 
I have a, a copy of it here. It's so cute. The little um, S's were J's at the time, but this was a, a plaque that I, I found in the libraries. And it said, women speaking is justified and proved and allowed for by the scriptures because all such as speak by the spirit and power of the Lord Jesus. Women were the first to preach the tidings of the resurrection of Jesus. And so women should speak out against slavery. So they justified the fact that they could speak uh, on the scriptures. So the next slide, um, these women are ready to rock. They uh, decide to meet in New York City. They are so excited. This was unheard of, a national convention. The women had their little bonnets, little bustles, uh, and you were not supposed to travel unescorted, uh, but they came in little carriages, little stagecoaches, in steamboats uh, to gather at, a, at a, 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 a little church in lower Manhattan that still exists. Uh, I've gone by it and um, unescorted and from different backgrounds, 174 delegates met in New York City. So this was the first national political meeting of US women. This was the moment that was the beginning of American feminism. And uh, it was interracial and none of the men's abolition societies included African-American men or men of color. They were all white men, but these women were very committed and very intentional about lifting up all women, women of color. And so four, three points I wanna make and on the next, well, let's see, turn to the next slide. So I'll just mention, um, okay, here's the little place you can visit it the next time you're in New York. And on the next not slide is a quote of Angela Grimke. So once, once the convention, they had read Robert's Rules of Orders. They, were, they had really prepared and they came with a resolutions and they called the meeting to order in a, in a, uh, a very orderly um, way to run a convention. They had these resolutions and then they would take a vote yay or nay on each of the resolutions, Angela Grimke's resolution was, the time has come. Sorry, y'all, I'm gonna cry a lot in this talk. The time has come for women to move into that sphere which Providence has assigned her and no longer remain satisfied by the circumscribed limits with which corrupt custom and a perverted application of the scripture has encircled her. Next slide. These women were so articulate. They were so brilliant. Um, so basically, um, the faith, their faith fueled their vision. So let's go to the next slide. And um, Esther was their role model. And I don't want to run out of time. Let's go to the next slide. It, they, were, they really wanted to organize in a way that was relational. And um, I love that, I just love that I'm able to like get these people's pictures, the women and men, make them visible. The next slide is Sarah Grimke. She said, the right to petition is natural and inalienable. And it's derived immediately from God. And they, they just kept making everything a divine commandment because um, women couldn't vote, but they could petition. And so these clever women, at the next slide will show that they went door to door. And I wish I had time to tell you all the stories of, uh, they kept diaries about all this and they'd knock on someone's door and say, may I come in and, and I'd like you to sign my petition and tell you about slavery in the South. And a lot of women didn't know there was slavery because there was no radio or cell phone. But anyway, so, so the women then educated other women and educated the women about the importance of signing on. And they began to, they began, 
they began to collect millions of signatures and they sent them to Congress and Congress kept them on a um, table. And finally, uh, in 1837, they passed the Pinckney patent gag rule and resolved to ignore the petitions, take no further action on them. They took them out back and burned the petitions of the women. So the next slide, another thing that was unique about these women was their empathy. Um, and that was part of their organizing methodology. Women at that time, you know, there wasn't Walmarts. And if, if, if people in your family, their socks were worn out, you didn't buy another pair of socks, you sewed, you sewed the hole, or you, or women, women made clothes for their, their family or made blankets. And so sewing circles was part of their culture. And a woman named Elizabeth Chandler um, said, look, let's take all the sewing circles going on in our society. And instead of just sewing and talking about everyday things, let's, let's imagine, I mean, we're sitting here peacefully sewing while women are being sold as slaves in the South. And let's practice sympathy for our sisters in the South. And that phrase became a koan that began to, to move all around uh, the Northeast. Let's have sympathy for our, our sisters in the South. And at every, so she set up a protocol. Someone would stand and read a slave narrative because the slaves were writing about what their life was like. And, they, and the women didn't know about what it was like for the, their sisters in the South. So they, they learned about it, but they also, um, Elizabeth had the women imagine that they were on the auction block and their husband was being sold to one plantation and their children were sold to another plantation and they were then sold to another plantation. And they said, imagine what it's like for those women. We have to abolish the institution of slavery. So um, they, they, they voted for three days. They felt so great about the end of the convention and the women, again, they went out and started petitioning and they felt like, wow, let's meet again. Now that we're, we've got the attention of Congress, let's have a second convention. And they really imagined if they got together, everyone would applaud what they had done um, in the year's time. So they met and they chose to meet in Philadelphia and it, at Pennsylvania Hall. So in the next slide, you'll see what happened. Um, oh, this is, I'm sorry, if you pause for a minute, this is mental metempsychosis. The women practicing, you know, that's, maybe we can do that. Like, imagine, like John Lewis, like imagining a humanity, uh, what's his phrase was um, a human family where everyone could feel at peace with each other. But anyway, um, the next slide, uh, they planned for their next meeting and um, they, uh, they met, uh, the next slide is a picture of the hall where they met. And the women all had their diaries. And so we have so much documentation about what happened that I finally found in these rare book collections but um, of the libraries. But while the women stood up again, same Robert rules of orders, same protocol, they were trying to state a resolution and take a vote. Um, a mob circulated outside as they were having their convention and they were bothered by the, the mob was yelling, go home, go home. And the women ignored the mob. And then the mob started throwing sticks and rocks inside the windows, breaking the glass. And the women ignored the mob and, um, but the mob got more angry and were yelling and, and kept throwing things and breaking the glass and it was dangerous. 
and the women were afraid. And um, basically the chair of the convention said, look, let's link arm in arms, let's open the door, black women, white women, what two by two, let's just march out into the mob and hope they will part and let us leave because they're not letting, we, we can't even hear each other. It was so chaotic. And so the women stood up, linked arm in arm, opened the door, walked outside. And when they left, the next slide will show you what happened. Um, the, they did, they then set the building on fire. The mob was so angry. Um, so the women were very discouraged by this backlash. Uh, they met and the next slide it will show, they met one more time, um, but they were very discouraged by what had happened. And I just want to mention um, in the third slide, um, it's uh, the next slide, it's that so few people came. So it was half the size and they were afraid to do anything because the backlash was so great. So the next side has to do with Frederick Douglass. And um, like the women were basically almost forgotten, but Frederick Douglass in his autobiography said, when the true history of anti-slavery, the anti-slavery clause should be written, women will occupy a large space in its pages because the cause of the slave has been particularly women's cause. Her heart and conscience have supplied in large degree its motive and mainspring. Her skill, industry and patience and perseverance has been wonderfully manifest in every trial hour. So Frederick Douglass remembered and he wants all of us to remember them and not forget them. The next slide will indicate there was the first wave, oh, so they, the women did go to um, London with their husbands and for the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention, the first day when they came in with their husbands and they had traveled across the oceans, the men were so frustrated that the women were in the room, they spent the whole day to vote, could the women attend or not? And at the end of the day, they voted that the women didn't have to leave since they had come from all over to go to the meeting, but they had to go up into the balcony and sit in the balcony. They could not talk and they had to have a veil in front of them and they could listen, but not be seen. And so the men conducted this. They had been two days to conduct a three day meeting and uh, Frederick Douglass went and sat in solidarity with the women. So let's go to the next slide. Um, the first, um, what is the message here? Um, their faith was important. They worked relationally and empathy was part of the movement building. So let's go to the next slide. Um, Rebecca Walker, uh, Alice Walker's daughter uh, learned about my book and is passionate about it. And we have done a couple of talks together because in the first wave of feminism, it was about getting the vote. Second wave of feminism was um, equal rights in every way. And Rebecca Walker is part of something called third wave feminism that men are invited to work with the women for gender equality and it's a focus on relationships and an emphasis, em, emphasis on empathy. And this, um, in the next slide, we, um, we really want to talk about um, relationships are fused. Women were fused with men. Men's vote meant that it was his wife's vote also, or there was just a fusion and women needed to separate and then they could connect. And, um, and that's what's happening. Now, there is so much more gender equality. We're lacking racial equality though, however. So the next slide, um, 
This is a picture of first wave feminism. Let's go to the second wave. And then um, there's Betty for Dan, who was awesome, third wave. And um, the personal is political. Let's go to the next slide. So what's the next step? We think healthy relationships, healthy culture, healthy world. So, and we, and I'm just so honored to be here today. I didn't cry as much as I thought. I'm so grateful because I just, I'm so sorry these women have been left out of history and so grateful to all of you. I feel like you're a welcoming committee to say yay to these women and uh, honor their courage and their bravery. And um, I think we can begin to move into the panel discussion because um, yes, thank you so much for inviting me. Leika Sang was gonna be on the panel. I was so glad, but she had a sudden eye surgery and wasn't able to come. But, um, uh, and, but, but then I'm just so grateful Matrice and Jerry have, are with us. So Helen, this, yes. is, this is Larry. Would you like for me to introduce them? Uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful. And, and then I'll turn it over to you and you can, uh, you can, you know, proceed. So, well, I, yeah, I'm sort of, we just thought we'd have a conversation right. and I want to emphasize, you've heard about me, but I want this part of the session to be, or you've heard about me and my thoughts. These, yes. these two individuals are so experienced in so many ways and Gail Thomas, and uh, there are just so many other people that I'd love to lift up the, the vision of. Again, John Lewis, who said, democracy is not a state, it's an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. What a vision. So I want to, yeah, if, if I could just have... Um, both Jerry and Matrice. Yeah, let me introduce me. them real quickly, Helen, so everybody will know them, you know, and some of and some of what they've done and are doing. And so let me start with uh, Ms. Matrice Ellis Kurt. Matrice is a senior member of RSR Partners Board Recruiting and Chief Executive Officers Practices. Practices. She also serves as a member of the RSR Partners Executive Committee and has over 20 years experience in the executive search industry. She graduated from the University of Pennsylvania and her interests span the arts, education and transportation. She chairs the AT&T Performing Arts Center and is a Dallas City Council appointed member, board member of the DFW Airport Authority. And she is also a board member of the Dallas Institute. And Jerry Hawkins, He's executive director of Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation. He's incredibly active in our community. He is co-founder of the Imagining Freedom Institute, a co-principal of Young Leaders Strong City and co-creator of the Race to Equity DFW training series. He is a current Presidential Leadership Scholars Fellow, recent Leadership Arts Institute Fellowship graduate with the Business Council for the Arts, a trustee appointed member of Dallas ISD's Racial Equity Advisory Council and the Dallas County Historical Commission member. And Helen, I'll turn this over to you now. And let me remind our audience though, that they will be invited to a Q and A session in about 20 minutes. And so please be formulating your questions and entering them in the chat function so that uh, Helen and and uh, Jerry and Matrice can hear from you. So Helen, take it away. Okay. All right. You know, as we begin, even though we aren't configured just so that this won't be silent until we're all, the three of us are configured together. I think what I'd love the next 20 minutes to be is um, we've talked about the issue in uh, 1837, 
what is the, how would you language the issue today and what, what can be done about it? And what, what's, where, where, where is the help? What do you know about that's addressing the issue? You may language the issues differently, but, um, and I don't know, Jerry, do you wanna start? Sure, I'll start because uh, I do not want to follow, uh, you know, Mrs. Kurt. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, should. you can follow. You can follow <laughs> easily. <laughs> um, Go. <laughs> but I, I, my my work uh, centers the history of Dallas, um, and to talk about the present and the future, we have to talk about the past. Um, I will be remiss if um, every time I I try to speak about the history of Dallas. But I don't mention um, the name Jane Elkins. Um, Jane Elkins uh, lived where I lived for about nine years, um, right in our city on the corner of Northwest Highway and Marsh or Lemon. Uh, it is the most gerrymandered part of our city. It touches three different districts, uh, but it's also a very sacred place because Jane Elkins uh, was the first bill of sale of Dallas County. And the question I always ask myself is why, um, when you record something, right, you are, you know, making a statement. Um, there were Dallas, if you knew the history of Dallas, uh, even before white settlers uh, were here, uh, it was called the Three Forks area. Uh, it was the Arcacosa River by the Caddo Nation. Uh, it was a trading post for a long time. It was a place where people uh, traveled because it was a floodplain. Dallas is still on a floodplain. And so that meant that there were tons of things uh, traded here and, uh, you know, uh, tons of things happening during the economy. Why record this black woman as the first bill of sale of Dallas County is, is always my question. Um, sure, it was a lot of money at the time. She was sold for $400 um, in 1843 to John Young. Um, and in this uh, history of Dallas County, it says that she was uh, to be a slave forever and uh, to belong to his heirs and his assigns forever. Um, but she was also the first woman uh, illegally executed in Texas history um, on my birthday, May 27, 1853, in front of the Dallas County Courthouse. Um, and I think about you know, her history. She was also um, dug out of her uh, shallow grave and was used for experimentation as many um, enslaved people were uh, for experimentation for early uh, Dallas uh, doctors. And I don't think we can talk about um, the history of like where we're going without talking about that uh, because Dallas is a business model of a city. Uh, and so if a black woman is the first uh, sense of economy in a city, uh, that means something. Um, and it, it, it alludes to some of the things that we have seen um, you know, with our economy, uh, with the lack of um, economic inclusivity, uh, the lack of economic mobility by neighborhood in Dallas. Dallas is at the bottom of all of those numbers, um, particularly when it comes to our women of color, uh, especially now during COVID where women of color are the majority of the uh, frontline workers. Um, and there's a New York Times article that says that women, particularly women of color have lost their jobs uh, by far more than anyone else in the pandemic. Um, so I, I, I think that we start with history um, as you have uh, beautifully done in your presentation, um, but we also uh, can try to address those things, right? Um, it starts with some of that relational stuff that you talked about, right? And you talk about this in safe conversations all the time. You know, what does an apology look like uh, for, uh, you know, something like native removal and slavery from a city, right? What does is, what is, uh, acknowledgement look like? You know, what does uh, restitution look like? Uh, what does repair look like? And I think we can explore those things because they've been explored throughout our history. Uh, and so that's where I would start. I would start by, by digging into, you know, uh, how Dallas was founded and it was founded, um, you know, with stolen land and stolen people. There's a lot to unpack in what you've just described, Jerry, because um, you are so right and it aligns exactly with what um, Helen has written about um, so much of what we, who we are today um, is, is steeped in um, all of these 
um, elements that have been a part of our history, um, you know, selling um, individuals, um, not accepting the rights of others. Um, I'm especially, uh, when I was reading through the book, uh, one of my favorite parts is uh, when one of um, the women um, who also believes in, in religion and, and is a religious woman, um, but, but talks about the fact that the Bible was written by men. Um, the Bible did not intend for um, it to not reflect on women being equal. Um, and, and I think I go, back, I go back to all of that to say, I, I, I'm, I'm still challenged um, by some of the aspects of, of how we came to be. Um, when they wrote, all men are created equal, all men and women, and that should be all um, that, that, includes, um, that includes people of color as well, blacks. Uh, so, you know, as, as we start to look at, at all of these, these aspects, um, you know, there, there is an aspect of this that, that is, is, is based on, on commerce. Um, and, and as a result of that, um, you know, it has created this situation um, that, that all of us continue to be oppressed by and, and to live in. Um, and at some stage, um, you know, for there to be a reconciliation or if you want to call it, um, you know, um, the, uh, 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 you know, transmigration where you can, you can feel the, the, you can be empathetic and be in the shoes of another I think it, it begins a lot with understanding, accepting, to, to Jerry's point, apologizing, um, but also learning and being aware of the history. I think that this book is so illuminating because again, education is freedom. And it's said in this book so many times, I love the fact that they talk about the fact that education is, is, is the way to get out. And when you hear about Grace and, and Sarah Douglas, and they talk about, you know, their lives and the fact that um, they thought that they were going to be okay because they were educated. But then in 19, in 1832, there's a law that's passed where they now have to walk around with their papers to demonstrate that they are a part of society, free society. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's important to look at that and even to look at today, um, you know, we have a constitution in, in this United States, um, but black people live by the amendments of that constitution. We do not live by the constitution itself. So I, I think that that's an important aspect that we all have to, to accept and to begin to dig a little deeper into. I'll stop there. Do you think the city, uh, I think some people on this call aren't, just from Dallas or sure. Texas, but for those of us who are, you know, what is, what is the best thing the city can do? And thus any city, like how can cities, um, you know, I, I so appreciate the protesters and um, uh, we have a daughter who I, I'm so proud of her. She was a major uh, support around Black Lives Matter when it began. And she is right on top of stuff. She, uh, when Occupy Wall Street happened, she was doing a dissertation and thought, why well, it was on solidarity. She said, well, I can't write a dissertation on solidarity and watch what's happening. And, you know, while CEOs are paid this and then, you know, other other people can't are taking home a wage that they can't even pay for their family's meals. That even though both were, you know, have full time jobs, the pay wages are so and unequal. So she went down to Occupy Wall Street, and I'm so proud of her alignment with the marginalized. And um, but um, so I love the protest on the street and. Um, but what, what else can be done, especially in this time? Yeah, so I, I know that we have a, a cityscape. If you've read uh, the architectural critic, uh, Mark Lamster's um, articles in the Dallas Morning News, he's been um, very um, illuminating about um, how Dallas is built. 
Um, and he made a statement in one of his articles that says the city was built on white supremacy. Um, it sounds like a shocking statement until you read, you know? Um, I'll give you an example. Um, while, uh, you know, this amendment was being ratified in 1920, um, in Dallas, uh, 1920 uh, was being set up as um, what D Magazine calls the most racist city in America. Um, Dallas had the largest Ku Klux Klan membership out of any American city in the 1920s. So if you can imagine, um, you know, women are excited about the right to vote, but black women are getting nowhere near those polls because they would be risking their lives, right? Um, and um, I think about, you know, 40 years later, Juanita Kraft, um, who was working um, with young uh, black women to desegregate the State Fair of Texas, and also putting their bodies on the lines, right? Um, and, and the embodiment of Juanita Kraft as a person who also sell, sold poll tax uh, so black people can vote in the first place, right? Uh, so it's just, it's, it's just, uh, just really interesting to think about um, not only the layers in which people had to do, you know, just to exercise their, their rights, um, but the environment that was created. Uh, the city of Dallas in 1931 also set up a segregation of races charter. Uh, in that charter, it says uh, that people of the Caucasian race, and they use this word, I don't, I don't use Caucasian anymore, right? But it says people of the Caucasian race have to be separated in housing from the people of the color race. And then they go um, further on and says, color race is defined as people from the African uh, ancestry. So this wasn't removed from city charter until 1968, right? And so you have also 40 years of uh, segregation of races charter. So it, it was, you know, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and if, if folks don't understand the amount of work, uh, you know, we need to do this, this uh, political education that we're doing right now, right? More of these uh, conversations about uh, why are we here? Why would people be protesting out in the streets and waste and, and, and risking their lives under COVID-19? Um, and, and what many say is the largest uh, civil demonstration in the world, right? We're talking about 28 million people uh, around the world during uh, this summer. So. Uh, it's a lot that you are. Oh, I, I don't know how uh, of the people viewing how often y'all spend time just really getting to know South Dallas. And uh, I taught junior and senior English at South Oak Cliff for two years. So I learned about some things in that way. But um, it was such an honor to get to talk to Matrice and Jerry a couple of days ago prepping for this. And I told them that on Martin Luther King uh, weekend, uh, there's often a march down Martin Luther King Boulevard where people can just sort of march and sing hymns every 10 blocks we stop and, and you know, just honoring all, all he did and died for. And, um, um, and how frustrating it is that uh, my husband Harville goes with me and there are no public restrooms. <laughs> and there and there so many of the streets were made with no curbs and the plumbing. I mean, once you're down there, they're just the North Dallas, you know, there there are public restrooms, there are curbs on the street, there's plumbing that helps, you know, works. And in South Dallas, the same city was just built differently as if. Some people are important and some aren't. And it just, I don't know. I can't imagine treating humans like that. So one thing to do is next Martin Luther King, why don't we all meet on Martin Luther King Boulevard and um, March? So that's something we could do, but any other, any other, thoughts you have, because I think um, several people have left questions in the chat, but. And I, I think we should answer them, but I, I, I think it's important. And I think what you all have said, uh, we can't, we, we have to have these conversations and, and they're not comfortable conversations for, for many. They're not comfortable for us. They're not comfortable for you. Um, but, you know, there, there needs to be uh, a willingness 
to come to the table to say and to acknowledge that there are inequities, that there is social injustice. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, even just during this year, um, the conversations that we had around the words Black Lives Matter um, were, were very intriguing. It, it's not suggesting that other people aren't important. It's just saying that there are Black lives that are important, as important as other lives. Um, and, and those words need to be said because they're not said. So those are the kinds of conversations that people are started having. And I think that they're very relevant. They're important in this city. Um, I think that the, the divisions that um, have existed continue to exist. So this is, as you just described, you've been down on MLK Boulevard, um, you know, but it's not just MLK Boulevard. It's it's other areas. It's 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 the housing. It's it's jobs. It's education. It's every aspect of what we purport you need to have the American dream that is is at some level um, less than in certain environments. And and I do think that that's an important conversation um, that we need to have. So let's keep talking about it. <laughs> Well, so Helen, should I um, should I read some of the wonderful questions and comments we have on the chat? Yes. Okay, so I'm starting at the top, and here's the first one from C.V. Harquail. Uh, she's in Chicago, and so she says, "Would love to hear more about what it means that these women quote work relationally. Can you share some examples? And also, why do you think these women?" and their efforts were forgotten. After the mob burned the building down, we just forgot? The relational work, um, it, it was because they couldn't vote and they had to think of some way of having an impact. And so they thought about petitioning and they took the time to get to know each other. And this is, um, uh, so this is a right brain thing to do. Like, 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 like Matrice said, like, let's keep talking about this. Like, let, let's keep having this conversation. They took the time to have the conversation. And so that's, and then petitioning, you know, that's relational. Okay. And, and so what about, we just forgot? Oh, we just forgot. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, you know what? No one's ever asked me that question. Yeah, I think, how how dare they? Like, how did, yeah. yeah. Um, right. But, um, but, I, but I think, oh, let me, let me try to answer that first question better. Do you, how many people sit at home going, ain't it awful about this? Ain't it awful about this? Ain't it awful? Y'all, yeah. let's take to the streets. And uh, one of the happiest days of my life, was I, I, I said to someone, um, we were talking, and I said, well, how are you? How are you? And I said, I was, I'm fine. I'm, most of my goals have happened in my life, and, except one. And they said, well, what, what goal did you not achieve? And I said, well, I haven't been arrested. And they said, what? And I said, well, I, you know, I feel like if I'm living in a democracy and I care about things, I should take the, the streets and get arrested. And she said, oh, I can fix that. I help people get arrested anyway. And so I have been arrested. <laughs> and, um, and so let's, let's demonstrate in some way. Like, don't just stay at your, you know, in your house, on your sofa, talking about ain't it awful, this should change, this should change. Let's figure out something to do relationally. Okay. Let me go to the next question. And this is again to you, Helen, from your presentation. I am interested in hearing more about the three phases of relationship and what that looked like. Well, my beloved Harville has been asked to speak um, in a few minutes and it, it was his, his, his analysis of relationship which so is so brilliant that symbiosis is means we're fused with people. And so women were supposed to be fused. Like the man spoke 
for his wife and the kids. That's how the culture used to be. And the first thing you have to do if you're fused in a relationship is differentiate. You have to separate and then you can connect. So there was a slide that said um, those, what Harville talks about of a three steps toward a healthy relationship. And I think that's what protesting is and going to jail. I have a police record, I've been fingerprinted and um, I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's something we can do, right? <laughs> the rest of us can do it if it hasn't happened. Let me move on. And this is a question from Sidra Lalden to everyone, to all the panelists. I'm wondering how focus on relational aspects of racial and gender equity can be used to foster truly intersectional feminist movements within the current political climate in the U.S. and abroad. Wow. Well, it, but I know within the feminist world, there's great interest in doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very blessed to be in touch frequently with Gloria Steinem. I'm so honored. Uh, and the reason Gloria is really interested in my work with Harville, Gloria says society should be linked, not ranked. She's been saying that for a decade. And this she's- Gloria so Steinem. Free. Yeah. And, and in fact, the Miss Foundation sells bracelets that says we should be linked, not ranked. Mm -hmm. And there's a video of Gloria talking to Princess Markle. What's her name? Megan Markle. Megan Markle. So she's out in California talking to Princess Markle, Princess Megan, and she gives her one of the bracelets. And you can actually see the little video. Maybe I'll send it to those of you who are attending. And Gloria says, Princess, we need to be linked, not ranked. That's her vision of the future of um, the next stage of, of global feminism. And that's all races being linked. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I love the fact that, that um, women, you know, are, have been a part of this, um, this whole process from the beginning and, and everything starts, starts with women. Um, I do believe that, that the conversations are, are good. It creates the beginnings of um, creating action items, um, ways in which we can actually move and shift from just a conversation um, to actual, to action. And, and I'm, uh, I'm always reminded, my great grandmother um, would always tell me, uh, you know, that, um, that you can't just have a plan um, of attack. You've also got to attack. Mm. Mm. Yes. Wow. Great. I think we um, that image of Matrice, like let's get a billboard. Frozen, right? and go, yeah. Attack. <laughs> so, so Jerry, would you have anything to offer here about uh, relationships? Yeah, I. I well, number one, I think it's really important for men to understand our role in this work, um, particularly um, when it comes to gender equity and racial equity. Um, we are still uh, paying women uh, less than men for the same job. Uh, we are still having uh, superior uh, racial and gender gaps when it comes to pay. Um, and we are also, um, not understanding how uh, gender and, and race work together to uh, create uh, what Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw talks about is intersectionality, um, how the intersection of race and gender um, really affect in a different way that people don't recognize. Um, and so that means that for instance, um, uh, a, 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 a man that is killed by the police like George Floyd will be more popular than a woman who is uh, killed by the police like Breonna Taylor. So um, when she talks about these things, I think it's really important for us to recognize that we have to create um, not only spaces for women, but also step out of the way. Uh, we have to uh, lead the way in, in the gender uh, pay gap. Uh, that means if we are owning businesses, we have to make sure that women are getting paid uh, the same, if not more than men, <laughs> for, for the same role. Um, 
and we have to highlight, uh, you know, some, you know, women who have been erased uh, from history. I think for, for me, it's really important uh, to mention some of those women. Um, people like Dr. Mamie McKnight uh, from Black Dallas Remembered, who uh, led the, the charge to get uh, the Freedmen's Memorial on 75 and Lemon uh, established, which is one of the most important archaeological sites in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, women like, um, you know, Annie Heads Rainwater, who helped, um, you know, integrate Carrollton ISD uh, schools. Uh, women like Adolfo Cayo, who uh, was a, a Latina a lawyer who helped, um, you know, change uh, politics in uh, Dallas. So c- continuing to highlight, um, you know, the, the work of women who have done amazing things in our history and uh, telling those stories is, is so important for men to do. Yeah. Let me mention two women, uh, Jean Stevenson Mosner, uh, at Perkins at SMU, her amazing book, she's written maybe in the past, but she has a future one, Women 2020, about what's the vision in the future and China Gallon. Mm-hmm. I just see that she's on the chat and China, uh, well, years ago, she doesn't, she's in California, but she wrote a book on um, on uh, black, black cemeteries here in Dallas that were just, rammed over um, when they needed the land to build a building. And that she's chronicled um, this, the graves in Texas, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, we really want to lift up these stories. So, uh, but because you, you mentioned these names and Jerry, you mentioned those wonderful names and we're recording this and so we're going to capture them. And Matrice, glad to have you back after being frozen for just a couple of minutes, you know, there. But um, let me go down to these two women that you have um, have mentioned here. You know, Jean Stevenson Mosner, I think, and she has a question, and this is her question to you, Helen. After 1838, did the female anti-slavery society and the subsequent suffrage movement continue to be interracial? Well. Suffrage was not interracial. And um, uh, the uh, Anglo women, I think they were afraid, the white women, and they would say, well, let the white women get the vote. And then then we'll try to help people of color get a, the vote, which was, excuse me, I don't want to use profanity. Okay. But that was inexcusably horrible, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. And so, um, what was the second thing? I'm sorry, I'm all wrapped up, and I was, I was really, I'm so dis. The suffragettes had a masculine organizing style, in a way. It was very left brain, and the um, the feminist abolitionists they were very right brain. You know, just let's practice having empathy <laughs> and empathy and and the cause of the slave is ours. I mean, and it sort of woke them up to their own slavery, their emotional feeling for the slaves in the South. And they said, well, goodness, there are ways we're slaves here in the North in a way. So so they just felt really connected and and. Um, Empathy was their organizing, and yeah, it was a feminine, more of a, maybe you can call it a feminine or a right brain style versus um, uh, suffrage. Well, let me move to, um, you know, you've talked, you're, you've talked about these women who are writing, and this is from China Gallon. Um, Helen, I can hardly speak, I'm so filled with emotion. And I'm so touched by not only your book, but by Jerry Hawkins' remarks and Matrice Ellis Kirk's comments. I'm writing about this subject right now. What do we do? An apology is meaningless without action. And people have come to me and said, okay, now I see why you wanted to make the Resurrecting Love documentary. So some responses to that, you all. What do we do? Yeah, I mean, I, there's another, I just have like just tons of examples. Um, 
currently there's a black woman uh, fighting for uh, her life and the life of her community. Her name is Marsha. Uh, Marsha is leading this fight uh, against Shingle Mountain. Um, which is uh, this mountain of uh, roofing shingles that was uh, put there by a recycling company uh, and allowed to do that because the city of Dallas allowed it. Um, this is not the first example of uh, environmental discrimination in a, a community. Um, I, I I'm, would be remiss if I didn't mention Deepwood Dump, which is the largest um, illegal dump in Texas history. Also, um, you know, a movement led by uh, the black women and, and the men there uh, in Deepwood uh, from 1982 to 2000, uh, da Dallas allowed uh, this illegal dumping to occur. I believe Mayor Ron Kirk said it was the, the worst environmental uh, disaster ever heaped on a community. Um, and uh, those people led that fight from 1982 to 2000 and had to sue the city of Dallas. What happened was a, a reparations ordinance, a local reparations ordinance in which private and public uh, came together. Uh, they couldn't move the trash because it was so much, uh, but they put a landfill over it and created this beautiful uh, reservoir where folks can go and, and, and view nature. Um, everyone in 75217 is supposed to be uh, you know, able to attend for free. Um, obviously, there's still work to do because it's on a highway. There's no sidewalks, as you mentioned. 90% uh, of Dallas is sidewalk poor. Uh, but um, it, it was done, right? And there was uh, some apologies made because of Judge Barefoot Sanders asked for that. Uh, there was some restitution made, right? The, this dump was closed and there was a, uh, something put over it. So I believe that, um, you know, ordinances like this and things are possible because it's happened already. Um, Hamilton Park is also one of those things as well. We know the history of Hamilton Park. So I, I believe it can happen. And I, I do think uh, that we need to do it more and we need to do it now. You know, Fair Park is another example of where that needs to happen. Yeah. And, and Jerry and Helen are right on. I mean, spot on in terms of all of the many things that we can do. There's so many projects and I'm looking at a lot of the people in this um, in the list there and a number of the people here who have been involved and have contributed to ways in which um, you can improve communities. Um, but there needs to be a holistic approach to some of these things, I think, in a way in which we can um, come together, acknowledge um, the inequities, um, because uh, we're in this group together and we're all, I, I almost think we're, we're singing to the choir um, because there's a large segment of the population that does not believe in this, in this way. And we have an opportunity to help them to see some of these, um, some of these ill forgotten um, uh, things that have been done as well as um, opportunities in which we can lift up our communities. You know, it's interesting because when I was reading through the mm. book again, um, I was struck by the number of times I saw the word sympathy. And I understand where we were, where they were going with the word sympathy. I prefer the word empathy um, because, you know, I, I, I would much rather you not feel sorry for me, but to help me get out of the situation um, in a way that allows me to be proud of myself as well. And so, you know, I think that that as I go, as I think about the opportunities, um, it's people like us coming together and saying, let's put together our own society or partner with someone that's in existence doing this, whether it's with Jerry's organization, whether it's with Richie Butler's organization. There's so many organizations that are focused on this. Let's get behind them and help make this a reality. We have so many young children who see the possibilities um, in themselves, but then are totally squashed by what they see in their communities versus what they know other people have. And if we can just find a way to take our genius into those communities and to help um, to physically do something about it, I think that's the way to make it happen. So uh, at this point, I want to no, go ahead, Helen. I just want to say, Matrice is so awesome. I just love, <laughs> she was, uh, Harvard and I lived in New York for 30 years. And when we came back, um, you were just 
not the mayor's wife at that time. I mean, I think the switch had happened, but you're just quite regal. And thank you. And Jerry, thank you. I just. Now, I'm going to start following Jerry. I'm doing whatever Jerry said. Uh, me too. <laughs> me too. Let's follow Jerry. So, so we're, I, I apologize to everyone in the audience for not getting to these amazing questions and comments. And there are a lot of them. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. And I think we have time for one more. So I want to bring us up to right now. Okay. And so this is from Rosalind's story. What are your thoughts on the current election and the role played by black women like Stacey Abrams regarding voter suppression and increased black voter turnout? Many have said that the role of black women influenced the outcome. If you believe this is true, why do you think it's happening now? Um, it is true. I uh, have been following and it's the amount of people who just sort of felt hopeless or apathetic and they didn't vote. Um, and uh, I, I know some, there's an organization called Wait to Win that our daughter started, this other daughter, who I, the other two things, and they've been very uh, uh, intent on getting the millennials to the polls and all, everybody to the polls. And they worked very hard, but they do say that throughout the whole country that the big difference was the number of African-American people that voted. They were, they just, before that, they didn't think their vote, didn't, their vote mattered. And so I think many organizations tried mm -hmm. to say your vote does matter. Mm -hmm. That would be my answer. Uh, I just got to give a, just a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, Black people are the most conservative people in the United States. Uh, the Pew Research Center says Black people are the most religious racial group, period. Right. So black people would be re Republican, to be honest with you, because uh, people like my mom and my grandma, they enjoy conservative values. My mom still wears a skirt all the way down her ankles. All right. Very conservative person. But black people are the, also the most socially progressive people, which means that black women, um, especially because they're on the intersection of race and gender, uh, support the Democratic Party by 90 percent. Right. They are the base of the Democratic Party. And uh, because of that, uh, we are going to continue to see black women out front and leading. Uh, Dallas is really interesting um, in that it has had all of the things that you could uh, you know, imagine to stop people from voting, right? Texas has been in court for gerrymandering, voter suppression, uh, voter ID laws, uh, voter intimidation. Uh, we've had federal monitors at the last uh, few elections and this is even under uh, the, the last president. We still have federal monitors, right? So uh, it is very still difficult and very hard to vote because of the Voters' Rights Act that has been dismantled by the Supreme Court. Uh, and Texas um, took a lot of those things to heart and made it very hard. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, you know Black women are going to continue doing that work. They've been organizing here in Texas, and just like uh, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, um, and that if we follow their lead. Um, and give them the resources that they need, uh, we'll be in a much better place. And I heard- you know, Black women have been doing this for a long time. Um, this, isn't, this isn't anything new. I mean, Doug Adams got into Alabama because of Black women. Or Barack Obama got into the White House because of Black women. Um, you, Bill Clinton got into the White House because of Black women. So, you know, it's, it's interesting that the Black woman's voice is now being heard a little bit more and the media is now talking about it a little bit more, but it truly has been um, the mainstay. And if you look at um, the way, um, go back to poll watching, go back to poll taxes, all of those things, Black women were sitting at the table and actually helping to make some of those changes. I mean, going back, just look at Shirley Chisholm all of those. So, you know, there's, there's a, a myriad of, of examples where, where Black women have been at the forefront. I don't think that's going to change um, because it still is a large part of the nucleus of a family um, base is, is a Black woman um, running that. So um, I think that you will see more of it. I agree with Jerry that we need to have uh, more engagement um, from others around it. But um, I think Black women organizing is going to become even more um, pervasive. And, and I did hear that state Senate uh, 
I don't keep up with things like this ordinarily, but someone I know knows the new chair of the state Senate. And he said, uh, very, very, you know, the state's Republican, but it's much more bipartisan now. Yeah. That it's, it, it is a Republican state and many, many more voices are lifting, are being lifted up. Yeah. Then, no, I think uh, I think also Helen, it's a function of the social issues. So that that are coming. I mean, education. You know, with um, mm -hmm. Texas, with House Bill Three um, being important, and um, you know, we're going to have to at some point start looking at healthcare um, with the aging of the population and and the cost. I mean, I think this pandemic has put healthcare back in the forefront. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of those social issues will will cause us to be a little more. Um, bipartisan, or perhaps a little more um, closer to the middle. And I vote for uh, Matrice, you and Jerry both running for office. <laughs> no, you do. That's <laughs> my final word. Yes. No, yes. no, no, no. Uh, I wish we could keep going on and on, and maybe we'll have a, a sequel to this, but uh, we do need to, to go on. Thank you all. Thank you, audience. And thank you, Helen and Jerry and Matrice. Now we have one more introduction and I'll ask Helen to make that for our final uh, speaker. Um, it was very amazing that feminist press did ask Carvel to help with the last chapter. They said, you know, given uh, Harvel's reputation as a relationship expert, uh, can he help with chapter eight? And um, so um, he's gonna say something and I don't know what he's gonna say, but <laughs> he is so committed to um, equality and justice. I cannot tell you how his blood boils if anyone is not treated equally. So, Harville. So, uh, well, <clears throat> thank you for <clears throat> thank you for including me in this. And Helen, uh, I, I uh, I'm going to say what you told me to say. So, oh. it, uh, it'll be really <laughs> good. <clears throat> what, what did I tell you to say? <laughs> so. I don't remember. So, so, I, so I will say that, but I first want to make a comment on the conversation that I've been listening to. <clears throat> and excuse me for my throat suddenly uh, clogging up. Um, that I'm stirred, just, just stirred by the conversation uh, and the, the uh, information that's in Jerry Hogan's mind uh, with such details about specific people doing specific things, the first uh, bill of sale in Dallas. I mean, who would have researched that? That's, um, and then he kept on more and more uh, details about uh, different people with different uh, histories that have been a part of, of Dallas history. And, and Matrice with a, a different kind of perspective, but so articulate about processes and about forces and, and society. And of course, I've listened to Helen's uh, views and conversations about women uh, now for about, uh, I get, would guess about 40 years or at least 35 after you got involved in this. But we've been involved in, uh, in a conversation ourselves about, and I wanna take a mega view and not respond to the concrete situation that exists now or about the details that you responded to, but to make a comment about what the frame is within which this conversation is taking place. That's been my interest is how come we're still having this conversation and, and how long has it been going on and, that, uh, and, and why? And our analysis of it is that there is a, a value system resident in Western civilization that is productive of uh, these problems and that this value system actually goes all the way back to ancient Greece and to the, uh, the, the, the rise of the first democracy had only 1% of the people in Greece who were actually uh, could vote, who were democratic and were a part of democracy. And about 98% of the people in Greece when democracy was first found were slaves. <clears throat> and so that the other has been a problem for human beings for a long time. And we think there's a value system about the self, the individual somehow has been the centerpiece of human thinking that we have to look out for the self. And that's a kind of simple, simplistic way of talking about it. And what we haven't grasped 
but I think, and I see we're grasping, is that we have to think about the context within which the self lives. And that we, um, it's interesting that the Greek experiment got lost for about 2000 years and got repeated in the American, ex I mean, in the French experience of the revolution, which came to America with another revolution, and that there's been an attempt to deal with oppression uh, in different ways, and that some progress is being made in the sense that nobody until now has had any opportunity to redress there without being oppressed and killed, that we now have mechanisms by which we can actually uh, protest and take our complaints into some sort of system. Into some sort of system. But the, the problem that still resides in, uh, in the culture, and I think in the human race, is that we've not comprehended the fact that we are connected, that we are all connected in a, not in a social, psychological, economic way, we're all connected ontologically, and that it is the nature of our being, and that it is, shows up in psychology and biology and and um, and in politics, but we're connected, and we don't yet know that as a species that we are a part of the fabric of being. That it's like a tapestry, that each individual is a node in the tapestry of being, and what one person does impacts what the other person does. We don't really know that yet as a species and as a culture, and I think we're beginning to know it. That is, but it's, but it's, cert it's certainly not a movement yet, but it's a clearly a movement that is being born at some nascent level. And Helen and I are um, in, engaged in bringing that into awareness of not only culture, but of the civilization. Um, and with the new value system proposed, so we operate out of three things. One is universal equality, is just absolutely the only thing that makes sense because everybody is equal. And so not to know that we are equal and to believe that we are unequal and have to become equal is a distortion. We're already equal. It's just not showing up in our uh, political, social, economic, and psychological uh, profiles. And that um, diversity, diversity is a fact of nature. Um, it's to, to, to be inclusive, to, to, to celebrate diversity would be to celebrate reality. I have a sentence here on my computer. D difference is nature being itself. So difference is the nature of nature. What's the problem with human beings is that difference is a problem for me so that I have to annihilate you so that as Helen used earlier with her symbiotic references, I have to annihilate you so that my point of view can dominate. And so that's a pathology that in that uh, diversity include diverse celebrating diversity would be that is the healthiest thing any group can do, any culture can do, and any community can do. And the third value system is uh, total inclusiveness. The idea of excluding anyone from anything that's available for their welfare is another pathology. But those three things, inequality, uh, a conflict around diversity and exclusion are three of the major uh, features of the pathology of our culture. And that we need to address those in my view at a fundamental micro level. And that is we, we, we have become uh, bold enough or arrogant enough or crazy enough to say that we address it at the point of the, the micro point of conversation between uh, anyone and everyone, that we have to finally figure out a way to have conversations that are safe. And when we have conversations that are safe, then we can talk about anything. But if we can't create safe conversations, then we can't really talk about the issues we need to talk about because we get into our anxiety, our defenses and our anger. So that we need to figure out a way for all of us to have a conversation and to have conversations and to have conversations in any ecosystem that's safe enough to have and that there's a way to do that. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to throw that out that we need, we need to move from a culture of separation and individualism to a culture of context and relationality in which everybody's included 
equality is absolutely universal and diversity is celebrated. And I think what Helen did, what these women did in the uh, 18th century was, a, a, big, was a, a real radical statement of that inclusive quality of the equality of inclusiveness and, and, and diversity. That was a little model of what, if it were expanded, could become the transformation of civilization itself. But thank but you, Everything Harvard. like that that starts gets snuffed out, and then it has to get restarted again. And that uh, we are further down the road than we were then, but we still have a long mile to go. So thank you, Harville. I'm going to say a uh, last sentence and pass it to Larry, but um, uh, I, I, I didn't know what you were going to say. That was super. And one of the things that Harville and I did, uh, you said, you know, we're connected, but we're also interdependent. And I mean, that's another phrase for it. Yep. And I love that this year on 4th of July, we just, we just, it was hard to celebrate our independence. I mean, yes, it was nice that we're no longer a colony of England. And yet, to Harville and me, no one, no one is independent. I mean, we're all interdependent. And so we just have said happy interdependence, happy interdependence on 4th of July, because that's our beauty is when we'll honestly admit we, we need each other. Yeah. We, 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 we don't, we can't exist without each other. We can't, ex we, we can't exist, you know, without our ecology being healthy or different, different, um, um, uh, 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 what do you call it? Um, economic levels working together. Like we need, we, we are interdependent. None of us are independent. Yeah, and Helen, I want to just throw in one thing to that. When you know you are connected, that we're all a part of the fabric of being, you can't hurt another person because then you know you're also hurting yourself. So, but the absence of that consciousness allows us to be abusive to others. But once you know they are a part of you and you're a part of them and we're all a part of something bigger than any of us, then violence is totally pathological. You can't hurt anybody when you know you belong, all belong to the fabric of being. So Larry. Back to Larry. And you're on mute apparently, I can't yes. hear. And now I'm unmuted. Yes. And thank you all. Thank you Harville for those final words. And again, to you, Helen, Emma Trice and Jerry. This has been an important evening and a very enlightening one. And thank you to our wonderful audience for being here and being heard. So, you know, this is the conjecture birth date. We're not real sure. November 19th in, in 1797 of Sojourner Truth. Uh, Helen knew this and she picked this date purposefully. She was a prototype activist for the causes of freedom and equality in this country. And so with those words, we wish you the best for the upcoming holiday season. Thank you and good night.